Well, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's Manulife Business Success Series. Today, we're going to be talking with Andy Taylor, Gore Mutual Insurance, an 1839 startup transforming during COVID. Um, it's going to be a fascinating discussion for a company that, that many of you will have heard the name uh, in, the, in the community for years and years, but how they're um, adapting and, and changing their business model in the middle of a pandemic is an interesting story. So uh, looking forward to this. My name is, of course, Ian McLean, and I'm the president and CEO of the Greater Kitchener-Waterloo Chamber of Commerce. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that we do live and work on the traditional territory of the neutral, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples as we seek a renewed relationship based on the foundation of mutual understanding and respect. As participants in today's virtual event, we are coming together as one. We believe everyone is free to be their true self and receive the same respect and opportunity regardless of age, ethnicity, gender, culture, identity, sexual orientation, beliefs, or language. We hope you will join us in fostering a positive environment here today that is a safe and welcoming space for all. We know there's more to do, and we are committed to listening, learning, and growing as we go. Today's session would not be possible without the continued support of our sponsors. And so today, a special thank you to our title sponsor for the Business Success Series, Manulife, our platinum sponsor for the series, which is the Immigration Partnership of Waterloo Region, and in this month's presenting sponsor, Gore Mutual Insurance. These organizations are committed to supporting our local economy and providing businesses with the resources and tools they need to thrive. Just before the session starts, I'd like to go over a couple of quick reminders. Please ensure that your microphone is muted throughout the presentation so we can reduce any background noise. If you have any questions that come up through the session, please type them into the question box in your control panel. If it's tech related, one of our chamber reps will get back to you right away. And if they're for today's spot, uh, presenter, I'll try and gather those throughout the presentation and get them answered throughout the course of the presentation. All attendees will be sent a recording of today's presentation and it will also be made available on the Greater KW Chamber website. I would like to now introduce today's guest speaker, Andy Taylor. Andy is the Chief Executive Officer of Gore Mutual Insurance, Canada's oldest mutual property and casualty insurance company. He currently leads the company's Next Horizon strategy, which supports the company's ambitious transformation to become a digitally led, purpose-driven, national scale insurer. Having worked with the board of directors and the executive team to develop the strategy over the last two years in his role as CEO, he will oversee the complete transformation of the company's operating model and technology platforms to create best-in-class solutions for brokers and customers. Andy joined Gore Mutual in 2005 and has held progressive senior roles within the organization, most recently holding the position of CFO and Chief Risk Officer at Gore, where he's, he was responsible for strategic finance, investments, reinsurance and risk management. He is currently a member of the Board of Directors of Gore, as well as Chair of the Board of, of Companies uh, uh, Subsidiary Distribution Business and a member of the Board of the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Before coming to Gore, Andy spent several years working on the advisory teams for several multinational chartered uh, professional accountant firms. He holds a BA in, uh, in economics from Western and is a chartered professional accountant. Join me in welcoming Andy. Welcome, Andy. Thank you, Ian. I appreciate that uh, wonderful introduction and uh, just a pleasure to be here with you today. So thank you for having me. Well, I'm, I'm, you and I are old friends. We, uh, we've known each other for a lot of years. Um, you lived across the street from my mom and dad. Our daughters played volleyball. So we knew each other aside from business. So, I, But it was a great opportunity when we reconnected and you took over at, at Gore a couple of years ago uh, to, to sort of have strengthen the relationship that we've always had between our chamber and, and, and Gore. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about about that relationship over the years. I mean, the, the the Chamber of Commerce. Obviously, you're in Cambridge. You're physically located in Cambridge at the at the Gore head office. Strong relationship with the Cambridge Chamber, but also had had uh, a, a deep relationship with uh, with the Greater KW Chamber, and in fact, the region of Waterloo. Let, let's start there about about Gore and its place in the region. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, uh, Ian, and I think. Um, Maybe worth even stepping back a bit around, um, you know, our history in the region and why that sort of segues nicely into our relationship with the chamber. Um, as you mentioned in the uh, in the introduction, 
you know, we are Canada's oldest uh, property and casualty insurance company. Um, and we, what that means is we sell home and auto insurance and business insurance. Um, and at 181 years old, we're actually older than Canada. Um, and we were founded right here in this community uh, in the district of Gore. And our roots have been here for many years and as a mutual insurance company, um, which is different from a stock-based company. Um, we are effectively you know, owned and, and run by our members and our policyholders, uh, many of who live in this community and our founding uh, members certainly did and came together. And so the view of a mutual insurance company is really very similar to a, um, a peer-to-peer, what you hear about in modern day, peer-to-peer -peer organization. And so we exist for a, a greater good than just you know, maximizing profit um, for shareholders value. We, we actually exist to really come together and care for each other as members. And so, you know, that ties back to the chamber and the great work that, uh, that your uh, chamber and the Cambridge Chamber have been doing over the years. We have always had a focus on really giving back to and uh, contributing to our community, uh, whether it was through our company directly or through our foundation. We have a, a very substantial foundation and over the years we've worked with the chamber and other organizations to um, support the local hospitals, local charities and, and important causes. So, um, you know, to us, uh, the work that we're doing and that you're doing in this community is, is fundamental to, you know, where we've come from as a company and where we're going, which we'll share a lot today about uh, mm -hmm. our, our transformation story. Now, a little bit about your background. I mean, it, it's always interesting to see where leaders come from. I mean, you, your finance background, but but maybe t talk a little bit about that, the importance of what you've learned, those skills bring at this moment in Gore's history, because it wouldn't always be the finance guy or the risk guy. It may, it may be other things that diff companies need at different times. But now you were, you were selected for a variety of reasons. Talk a little bit about your background and what that um, – brings to 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 this change transfer or this train change agenda that you're bringing to gore yeah great question um i guess my personal background too links back to um to the community so i was uh born and raised in this area um grew up in in kitchener waterloo and then spent half my life in toronto in my teen years worked downtown for a while and then i've been back for 20 years um and as you say i had a career in in, in finance uh, and accounting, but I always um, worked in the insurance industry uh, in the practices of those firms. And my journey here at Gore has been um, really a, a, an amazing one. Um, so one of the reasons I love living in this community is the balance that you get from uh, career opportunities um, that you know combine with quality of life. And so we've raised a family here in, in the community as, as you know, but I've also had the benefit of career growth um, over those years and tremendous opportunity. And so as you noted over the last um, eight years, I was the chief financial officer. I've been with the company for 16 years. So I've seen our organization grow from a, what we call a small regional insurance company. So 150 million in premiums. Um, and if you think of our industry, company size might range from 100 million to as, as big as 12 billion. And today we're $500 million organization over a billion in assets um, in the time that I've been here. And so I think um, the skills I, I bring into this new role, which for me is, um, you know, after 16 years, like an entirely new, you know, job yeah. and company, and we'll talk some more about that, um, is that history of, you know, where we've been as a company, the financial acumen to help us. Um, we're making significant investments in the business. Uh, just to give you a perspective, over the course of the next two years, we're putting the same level of investment in our transformation that we normally would have done over a decade. Um, you know, very, so there's a financial um, management piece to it that's sort of natural from my background. But also, I think, um, you know, the, the experience I've had over the years, I was very fortunate in the last two years to work directly with the board and actually one of my direct colleagues to shape our next horizon strategy. And um, so I think I bring a, a forward looking view to 
um, you know, we've been around for 181 years and we've been very successful, but the lens that we're looking at is, you know, what do we need to do to reinvent our organization and make sure we're around for another 181 years? Um, so even though sometimes finance and accounting uh, types can be seen as relatively conservative, um, you know, I guess I've got a nice balance of that with a forward looking lens on what's important for our strategy. Uh, going forward, and I'll share a bit about that so, in a minute. Yeah. So, so I think that the, that's the story I wanted to tell today. And I, some people would say insurance, and they go to sleep because insurance is not necessarily the most exciting part. But I think the transformation story is one that everyone, even if if you know, as they're watching this on on the webcast down the road, is every business that has been in business and needs to change should hear this story because it doesn't really matter the size of your business. But when you need to change in that transformation, this is an important part of what what uh, what we wanted to get out today. And it's no different for chambers. The chamber world is changing. Membership based, based organizations are changing, and we have to change with it. I think COVID has really accelerated that. Maybe let's talk a little bit about the the transformation. And I would say it covers just about everything you do. It almost is a complete transformation for a company that has what did you say, 500 million in revenue and a billion and a half under under uh, investment. Uh, that's, a, that's a big organization, but you're doing a complete transformation. Let's let's talk through w w why that is and what, what's involved. Yeah, it's a great, um, it's a great story. And, and I think a couple of key points, you know, you, you, in the introduction and in the header, we, we referred to ourselves as an 1839 startup. And, and yeah. we love that term because, I mean, we quite literally were founded in 1839, you know, 181 years ago. But in many ways, this company is a startup again. Uh, you're right. The scale of the transformation is a complete rebuild of the organization. And I think, um, again, back to our mutual roots and um, why we're doing this. I think many companies um, in different industries, doesn't have to be in insurance, sometimes get into a rhythm um, and they're successful, things are going okay, and they don't change and innovate, and then it's too late. Um, and they find themselves in, in financial stress and trying to work their way out of it. So we were fortunate, again, with a, being a mutual company, we were not constrained by the same um, the same pressures that a let's say a quarterly stock company would have but looking very short term in nature we can really look at that what's in the long-term best interests of our organization our employees our community and when we did that we said um, you know what when's the best time to change it's actually when you're strong when you're in a position of strength and you know you heard me say earlier we've grown from 150 to 500 million so the company is actually on a great path but what we did was we looked out 10 years. So rather than the next two to three years and keep doing what we're doing, we said, well, you know, we all know the world's changing at an exponential pace. Um, the pace of technological change, um, consumer uh, demands and expectations, um, you know, changes in demographics, climate change is a big one for us. Um, so when we look out 10 years and there's massive consolidation and other things happening, we actually quite candidly said, you know, if we don't transform ourselves now, we won't be capable to compete in that space 10 years out. And that led us to what we call our next horizon um, strategic transformation. And there's a few key components to it. Our vision um, is to be a purpose-driven, digitally-led national insurance company. And I think the purpose-driven piece um, is really exciting for us, particularly for our employees. Again, back to our roots as a mutual insurance company, um, we exist for a greater good than just creating shareholder value. So we can really come to work every day and have an impact in the world. And so the profits that we make as a mutual company are reinvested in our business and they're reinvested and redistributed into the community um, for a greater good. Uh, so we, what we recognized is um, people don't understand today what um, a mutual insurance company is. So there's a role for us to modernize that value proposition, uh, and we're, we're calling that our path to purpose. The second piece of it, when we, what we refer to as digitally led, is the transformation of our operating model. And again, this is going from very traditional um, business workflows and an operating model to 
redesigning all of our um, our internal operating uh, business workflows, working with you know, best-in-class partners like McKinsey, for example, who are looking out around the world and saying, you know, this is the best um, in class uh, specialization and standardization that we can bring to your business. So all of our workflows being um, changed and renovated, for lack of a better word. At the same time, over two years, we're replacing all of our technology and we'll be the first company um, in our industry to be completely on the cloud um, with our uh, core policy and management systems. Um, so really trying to lead on the technology front. And then the third piece of the transformation, which is the one I'm the most excited about, is our talent. And this again gets back to our opening comments around our community. And um, we are investing more in talent than we've ever done before in the history of this organization. Um, just to give you a sense of that scale, we have a new executive team, a new leadership team. Uh, we have onboarded over 100 new people into this organization just in the last 12 months alone, and we are onboarding another 100 in the next year. So 200 people um, new to our organization, excited to be a part of our journey, helping us with this transformation. Uh, but I think back to your initial um, question, really, it's really embracing the concept of changing when you don't need to change, you know, trying to look out in, you know, five, 10 years ahead at the trends and get yourself into a position so that you're, you're on the offensive versus finding yourself in a defensive position. So uh, there's a couple of things in there, maybe to kind of go over. The purpose driven, I mean, insurance is a global industry. I mean, there are big players, um, you talk about the growth that Gore has had, and, and so finding that, what I still would say is a niche in the Canadian market and being what it is, which I think leads itself to, you know, the importance of why mutual and why still staying in this community, because it does lead to the talent, because we're close to talent, close to Toronto, uh, and, but technology is another one that will drive where you get your talent from, because it's not geographic based anymore. COVID has proven that for us, or to us. Um, but but that technology change is back in the day. I mean, I think still you still have to have your little pink slip for car insurance. Uh, I mean, they're they're you know can't even do that electronically. Uh, there are some things that are just so antiquated, mostly government related, government regulation as opposed to the industry. But are those the types of things you're trying to get? Is better experience for the end user, better experience for the broker network that sells your product better experience for being for answering questions better customer service because purpose driven um, getting more more talent um, being purpose driven here and and technology driven it sounds like those things are all there's not you can't have one without the other they're they're sort of all all together yeah great com some great comments in there Ian, and and absolutely um in line with our thinking i think the purpose driven um piece has to be com combined with a high performing business model. So if you're a customer um, you know, coming to us, what we hope in the end state when we're finished our transformation is, we recognize, as you say, that insurance isn't maybe the most exciting topic for people, um, but we all need insurance. It plays a critical role in society and in our economy. And so you know, as a purpose-driven organization, we hope that um, when people select or they feel that, um, there's actually some good, like we're trying to do some good in the world. Our purpose statement is to provide insurance that does good. Um, and there's three pillars under that, be good, do good and spread good. And for example, be good is how we treat our internal employees, um, you know, leading and in wellness um, initiatives, uh, diversity and inclusion. Spread good is, um, you know, how we uh, make an impact in our community. And the do good is, is really around what we're doing for our policyholders and our customers. And I think you raised a great point there. Our, our industry, I would say, is like a decade behind um, some of the other financial institutions like banking. So you do your banking you know, on your phone uh, probably every day. Insurance is lagging, but catching up in a hurry. So there's been um, a significant investment uh, globally in what they call InsureTech, the modernization of the insurance platforms. And we've done a lot of work, as you say, on 
customer and broker experience. So um, today we sell all of our products and we will continue for many, many years to um, support our independent brokers that sell our products. But if you had that experience today, it wouldn't be very modern relative to some of your other um, experiences. The technology that we now have as an industry, so moving to um, platforms like the one that we're putting in place, gives us the ability to have direct connectivity um, with the brokers and create a better outcome for our customers. So just to give you, a, you know, just like an example, um, some of the workflows that we have in place, you know, in our previous operating model would be quite literally days um, of turnaround time. And we're moving to aut automated straight through processing, you know, digital, um, complete digital connectivity to our brokers. We're also working with outside um, firms on experience, like you like you just referred to. So, what is the actual experience when you have a claim, you know, from the customer's standpoint? In there, I think amazing um, progress is being made. So, through new technology platforms, we have, you know, we can respond and measure that we're responding in, you know, seconds and less than a minute, for example, versus you know, previously just the, we didn't have the ability to do that. So I think there is a combination of the purpose initiative, which is if you have to buy insurance, your money is actually going to make the world a better place, uh, including our investment portfolio, where we have a billion dollars, where we're really embracing ESG and uh, making sure that the money is uh, invested in a, in a way that is um, really thinking about climate change and making the world a better place. And then the experience itself, you know, supported by a digital um, transformation so that you feel that you're getting that same experience you might get in other industries. When I think you're right with your comments, I think historically the industry overall has lagged um, in terms of our ability to provide that for our customers. So it's an exciting time. Um, for our company, for our industry, for our employees, the type of employment opportunities that that creates um, is fantastic. So, so you talked a little bit about this, your, your growth in your, in your numbers at, at, the, at the highest level. Um, but I think that the reality, uh, it comes into focus, is you're expanding into the GTA. So you're, you're going to have more of a Toronto focus. Um, you've got, um, you've got uh, connections in Western Canada. So you, you've got, you're, you're becoming more of a, of a big national player, if you will, with, with different footprints in different places. Um, and I think one of the things, and, and we'll come to COVID in just a minute, but I wanted to sort of ask about, you know, as, as, a, as a regional uh, insurer, and you want to be a national, and you are growing, and you've demonstrated that, what, what's the importance of the GTA and, and the other places to that, to that growth? I mean, is it just yeah. Toronto's the, the financial marketplace or center of the universe in Canada? You just have to be there if you're, for, if you're going to be part of growth. Is that why Toronto is an important part? Yeah. Yeah, great question. There's a few pieces to that um, that are really critical for us. I think you mentioned, you know, we are a regional insurer and we our roots are here um, in this community. And so one of the, uh, the core principles that we've embraced is we do want to go from being a mid-sized regional insurer, 500 million to, our, our goal is actually to be a 2 billion plus national insurer. So four times the scale we are today. Um, in order to do that, we absolutely need to have a presence in the GTA, uh, both from a, you know, from a talent perspective, um, but also from a market perspective. So we historically have um, had a lot of our business outside of the GTA, but if you think of um, um, just growth in population, the economy, um, there, there's so much expansion right here in Ontario, or right down the road from us. And I think we'll talk about the corridor and the importance of that as well. Um, so the GTA is key. It's, it, you know, I don't believe we could be a meaningful national player and not be in the GTA. But what we talk about is that doesn't come at the expense of being here in this region. Uh, we're actually doing both. So we, um, we see our, and if you've ever been here, we have a spectacular, um, campus here in Cambridge you know it's been here for, um, for many many years we're very fortunate it's a beautiful property um, so we are investing significantly in this property I'm actually in the building here today um, to modernize 
the physical space here, and this will be the um, location of an entirely new operating model that we're launching, what we call our National Contact Center. Um, so Cambridge will remain our head office. Um, this is where I come to work every day, uh, and a lot of our executive team. It will be the core of our most of our personal insurance business and our National Contact Center. The, the, the offices that we have in Vancouver and the GTA will be more commercial lines focused as well because of the nature of the business um, in those markets. And we'll also use those to attract different type of talent that may live in those regions. Um, we're also, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the hybrid model that's coming out of this. Uh, but I think the key, the key point there is we're excited about, you know, national expansion, but retaining our, our, our core roots in this community and, and actually investing significantly in this, in this community still. So, so let's go to that, that hybrid model. And I guess the context I want to put this in, which is you may have been planning for this, right? Which it sounds like you, this is not something you woke up overnight. You've been working with the board. You've been looking for what your new plan is and planning 10 years out. So it's, you've been planning on it. COVID will have said, thanks for your plans. Uh, you better get going on it right now because it's here right now. Like all of us, how would we possibly work at, uh, with everyone working at home? Well, we all figured out a way to do it because you didn't have an option, or many did uh, in, in, you know, I would say insurance, finance, white collar, not for, pro you know, you can work at home. Let's talk about how COVID has accelerated those, that change that, that you were already doing because you didn't have the luxury of saying, we'll phase this in over three years. It's here and you're not going back on that. Um, and I, I guess in the context of that, what are some of the positives that have come from that acceleration? And what are some of the things you've learned and said, geez, that's not as good for our business and we need to do more work on it? Because it's it's a mixed bag for everyone, including us as a, as a chamber. So maybe talk a little bit about that hybrid model, but how COVID has either accelerated or, or really um, brought into focus the good and the bad of, of what your plan was. Yeah, yeah, I think i um, excited to talk about this topic for sure. And I think you're right. This is not at all specific to insurance necessarily. Oh. This is something that every call I'm on is top of mind for every, uh, you know, everyone who's in, in a leadership position trying to figure out how do we navigate through this. I think if I step back, just take us back to the beginning of COVID, so March of last year, um, you know, we all had no um, no idea that, that it was going to be this this significant. I think the first reaction I, I had was, you know, just as, as you did with your organization and many others in our community, we actually moved people to a virtual model um, within a matter of days. And, you know, we, we literally moved like 400 people uh, to a full virtual model. And our brokers moved to a full virtual model. And I can honestly say um, we didn't have one hiccup in terms of, you know, actually running our business. And I think to, to, your, um, to your earlier point, that would be a big surprise, certainly to me and to many people. If you'd asked me, like, could we move 400 people, work from home, run the entire industry um, from our basements in our pajamas, you know, I'd say no way um, like that. I think the, that the, re, the fact that we all had to do it at the same time created uh, the uniformity across the platforms and everybody working in the same way. So I think that was the first hurdle. For us, it was even more dynamic because we had just launched our strategy um, that I talked about. So in January, we were all in this building with, you know, quite literally, um, you know, hundreds of people, we're talking about running out of space uh, physically. We had consultants here and we were doing, you know, daily huddles and scrums and all the stuff you do. Uh, so, we're, so we're trying to figure out how do you keep that going in a virtual um, space. And then on top of that, we have an entirely new leadership team. Um, so it was, it was an incredible time. And I would say quite stressful um, in the early days. Mm -hmm. If I transition to kind of some of the benefits then of the, just pure, not even getting the hybrid yet, but just to the pure pandemic environment. I think, um, you know, we brought, in my example earlier, we brought a hundred people on during that period of time and a new executive team, some of them who started the week of COVID. Um, 
And it's ironic because we, I've never met many of these people, uh, right? I'm, like it's physically, been over a year now. Physically, you've never met them before. I've never physically met them, right? I mean, someone who's in the office today, um, one of our leaders who I met for the first time today, it's been, you know, he's been here for the whole period of time, right? So that's just an example. Of, but I know him, I know him so well because I actually spend almost every single day virtually online. So the one benefit I think for us, which is interesting was, I actually feel like I know our employees better and I've spent more time with more employees because of the ability to do that virtually. If we were in a traditional office environment, people tend to have habits and processes and meetings. And so that was one I think that was interesting. The other one I think is the fo we had the benefit of focus. So with a strategy as big as what we were working on, there was no debate about what the priorities are and what we should be working on. Everybody knew exactly what the, the key initiatives were. Uh, and I do think during a crisis, sometimes you can have a little bit of chaos, um, you know, and we were fortunate we didn't have that. We also made the decision really early on, again, I think this goes back to our mutual roots and taking that long-term view on, a, on the business model to not, um, not stop anything, but actually increase the investment um, in our transformation. So you, many times companies will run into a crisis like this and they'll, they'll start cutting a headcount or cutting expenses or retrenching. We actually went out right away and said, no one will lose their jobs. Uh, employee wellness is our primary focus, making sure that we take care of our people. And actually we're gonna accelerate our investment and try to innovate our way out of this crisis with faster digital technology investments and other things, as you say, that that came so quickly that we wouldn't normally have come. I think the other impressive piece for me is our broker distribution model, which even though I'd stand by my earlier comments that we're, we're all still a decade behind other industries, very effective in the way that they transitioned to this model as well and serve clients. Um, so overall, I think the actual experience was quite good from a business perspective, which kind of leads to the hybrid model, which has been really um, interesting because I think um, one of the questions that we're struggling with, and I think you are and all of our listeners maybe, people are saying, well, you've proven that it works um, virtually, so why would I have to ever come back to the office again, right? So this is something we're all struggling with, but we do see um, some negatives in this environment that we're trying to address through the hybrid model. And some of the negatives, I think, again, not specific to our organization, you would feel them, and so would all of our, our uh, listeners. Um, you know, that how do you build a culture when you've never met any of your, your peers, right? Um, there's something that naturally happens when you're together that's informal. Um, conversations about your family, your friends, your weekend. You don't set up a Zoom call to like ask about how the weekend went, right? So that's one that we're worried about. Um, and then I think the other piece is we found that people have worked harder and longer hours virtually and then combining that with the pressures of young families, homeschooling, this has been very stressful um, for most of our staff, I would say many of our staff. So, you know, you hear a lot in the news about, well, the office is dead and this is all so great. Um, we're all working from home. I feel like there's a middle ground that we're trying to find where we acknowledge that it's actually quite, quite difficult to be virtually all the time and there is a need for human interaction. So we're working right now on this hybrid model that if you visualize it, we're calling it flexibility with a framework. So. It, it, we will never go back to nine to five, everybody commuting to Cambridge for sure. But we do want people to be in the office for certain um, roles. You know, certain roles actually make sense to be in an office for certain events and meetings and training and culture. And so very early days, but we're trying to really shape a model that has um, a bit of the best of both worlds. And with our, um, with the GTA, with Cambridge, Vancouver, and then the virtual um, technology we're building, we think we can create something quite um, powerful for our employees um, in, in the next you know, few months. Yeah, you know, I think that's it. That's really important. Uh, I, I, you know, with just about anyone who is able, now obviously there's lots of your clients and our members who are really hurting because if you rely on 
retail restaurants where people have to come to your place of business it's a different kettle of fish although you know online and marketplace and uh, curbside etc it will be part of what they do moving forward but it's not in the same way that we can almost pivot entirely in the environment that you have where you can do most of it so but but I, I would say I think that's very I like the what would you say flexibility with a framework because I can't envision where we would ever go back to nine to five and have everyone into the chamber office every day. In fact, I won't do it. I know I'm more productive when I need to do my, my admin stuff. I can sit up, sit at my desk and do this. Um, but I think you do miss something. There's something that it, that gets lost in transmission. Looking at my screen because I I know you and it's not the same yeah. as doing it on the computer. So I think there is something to that. Um, but it leads to, you know, the, the question I have, if, if you accept that there's going to be offices somewhere and, and Cambridge, you've said, is your home base, you know, your history and your roots are here. Um, maybe talk about some of the other reasons. I mean, I, I, we're, we're very fortunate as a community to have U of W and Laurie and Conestoga. You have business students, you've got technical students, you've got you know, uh, engineers, computers, I mean, take your pick, all the things if you're if you're moving towards it, you can get the talent here in Waterloo Region. On the other hand, um, you, you, you know, in, the, in this new world, you're not confined to just this region either. I mean, you can say, you know, some of your top talent could be in other countries, let alone other provinces, um, yeah. you know, you know, but there still is a still, in many cases, still have to have a home base, and you've chosen Waterloo Region. Maybe talk a little bit about about drill into that particular yeah. part. Yeah, great, great comments. Um, I think you're you're right. Like if I if I go back, if I've been here for as I said over 15 years, um, we as a regional player struggled to attract and and sort of find the the talent we needed across our whole organization because in you know 15 years ago and what we were looking for um you know it was difficult because not everyone wanted to live i fortunately love this community and live here and i have a great opportunity but that wasn't the case right across the board so some of our employees were commuting from out of town Um, some of them lived here you have kind of a mixed mixed bag i think over the last decade having grown up in the community and i think we all see it um I mean, this is the most one of the most exciting communities in Canada, if, if not the fastest growing one. So there's so much happening in this region today that is so exciting. Um, if you if you live and work here, and you're right, I mean, we have three um, incredible uh, institutions here. So we we've, we've really taken advantage of that. So we do have partnerships with um, with Laurier, Waterloo, and and uh, Conestoga is a fantastic organization that. We have um, co-op programs with, so just this week, um, I welcome, just to give you a sense of the volume, um, earlier this week, I welcomed 30 um, new co-ops just for this this term. And I looked at the sheet and the talent is just so impressive. So it's right across our organization from technology, actuarial science, finance, insurance. So I think there's a breadth of depth of talent here in this community that is just incredible. So we're really fortunate with that. And your your comments are good one though. You know, I've heard this a few times. In a way now, the market is global. Um, so does that change our view? Um, the other thing we've seen though that's kind of counter to that, which again is favorable for this community, is many of many um, of our uh, talent and employees that lived in the GTA and other major metro centers have actually come out and moved to areas like Waterloo Region um, for a better quality of life. Uh, in some ways, the work from home um, has accelerated, and we've seen that in the real estate market out here. People wanting to say, well, hey, I can work in a new hybrid model. I can live in Waterloo Region, and I could maybe be in Toronto for a day a week and a couple days in the Cambridge office and a couple days at home. And so it's a really dynamic um, piece there. So I, I think we have the best of both worlds here, which is a tremendous talent to draw on from the community and the students that are here. And also, it's an attractive place to live and raise a family. Um, so there's a great, there's a great dynamic happening. 
Um, the other piece that's exciting for us, and you know, one, I know you've been leading um, really a lot of work on the um, all day go transit, trying to support that, and we're, we're a big supporter of that as well. That's another example of, I think, just um, you know, how important that is to, if you listen to our story about who we want to be, we want to retain our roots here, but we want to expand into the GTA. Um, I know I go into Toronto quite a bit and a six hour drive round trip is no fun for anybody, um, even if you're doing it one day a week. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think that's a key point of that culture, right? So the flexibility with a frame up, we see a, a model where we have our employees connected through uh, initiatives like um, all day go transit so they can be in Toronto for a day they can spend some days here I mean, it's, it's such an amazing model um, we're excited to see how that uh, how that evolves yeah yeah that was a great announcement that in the provincial budget and last week uh, Minister Mulroney uh, effectively putting some meat on the bones of a, almost a billion dollar investment to make sure that Waterloo Region Guelph Cambridge Waterloo Brampton Milton is connected to the GTA, so you can get end to end without uh, in a, you know, in not 75 to 90 minutes, which you couldn't do that in a car even if you tried. Um, but and but frequent, so you could you could make that trek in and out in in a convenient basis. Hugely important because we, you know, for all the reasons you talk about the talent part of moving people, but as much as your your customers and your clients are companies that are working along the corridor, right? And so getting. Um, getting people out of their cars onto trains and getting goods and services or goods uh, to market um, on the roads, which you need more. I mean, it, it just makes all kinds of sense. And so the partnership we've had with the business community like Gore and companies right across business sectors for the last three years saying, this is an infrastructure investment that is good for every business sector, finance, manufacturing, uh, services, retail, take your pick. Uh, and so huge, huge uh, uh, win for all of us that uh, we that we were we were able to to, to move that forward. So uh, that, that's a shout out to, to all our businesses for that. Yeah, it's so exciting. If you think about the um, you know the Waterloo GTA Tech corridor um, that's developing, I think again it, it's another link to our our transformation in our company. So I think you and I talked a little bit about um, insurance. That's been a, a, a an important industry for. Uh, the water of the region, whether it's life insurance or PNC insurance. Uh, but now we're going through a transformation. So insure tech and technology is actually um, even more important. And so having that technology base here in Waterloo region, um, it's, it's just so exciting. I mean, the, the nature of the change that's happening in our industry and the link to um, insure tech is a really big connection for us as well. So we're, we're fortunate that literally our office is in the backyard of, you know, Canada's uh, technology hub. Right? Yeah. But, you know what? I think that's worth diving into. I know it's, we're, we, I've got a few more questions, but I want to take a couple of minutes to talk about that. The change in, and you talked about one aspect, which I think we all know is natural disasters and climate change impacts the insurance sector. So, you know what you're paying out what what those those natural disasters that are more frequent more intense what they're doing to the insurance market but the other part that is a seismic shift is the importance of of um uh it's almost a, a more of a risk profile as as we become more um technology based ensuring what is your intellectual capital and your data capital if you will if you describe it that way very important and you know, um, Cowan Insurance is one of, you know, and, and others that, that are, and, and many companies would be in this saying, you better protect yourself. You, there, there's a there's business reasons you need to protect yourself. Is that a growing piece of, of, of what you need to be, uh, you know, making available through your broker network for, for business customers? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great comment. I think um, the products, the uh, solutions that our industry is offering are changing just as fast as the world around us. So cyber insurance is, is an offering that we provide to our small business customers. And I remember again, five years ago, um, a lot of talk about cyber insurance being important. And now we're talking about it for personal customers. So, you know, you're seeing more and more um, identity theft, um, cyber attacks, ransomware attacks. I, I would say in my history here at Gore, again, I was the chief risk officer in the past as well. We talked about these risks, 
but they weren't actually happening on a regular basis. And I would say now, today they are. Um, so it, it, there isn't a week that goes by that we don't have a conversation around a cyber attack that's happened in our industry to our company that we've, we've been able to manage. Um, so these are real risks for um, you know our, our policy holders, as you say. So there is new products that we're offering and the industry is offering to protect people's data identity um, from a cyber perspective. The other interesting area is around usage-based insurance and that's also been elevated coming out of um, COVID because people don't use their cars for example to the same extent that they used to um, so you'll see more products and we'll be offering them uh, as well where you know you can pay for how much you use your your car and if it's sitting in the driveway and you're in this new flexibility with a framework um, hybrid model working for a company you might only use your car twice a week right so there is different insurance products that are that are being rolled out to reflect that and same thing on the homeowner side right like homes have now become a home office um, so what does that mean from us protecting people's cyber so you're absolutely right there's a lot of innovation happening um, in the space of insurance solutions for customers and the one thing we do find and our brokers will be a big part of people don't always just have the knowledge right um, it's something that you have to have you know has to happen to you before you worry about it. So we've, we've got to do a better job of sharing that information, making them affordable to people, um, and making sure that they feel they're being protected. And I think that's such an important part. It's part of the reason that chambers exist. I mean, you know, as, as you and I talked about before, 75% of our members would have 10 or 15 employees or less. Like they're all, that's, that's what business is. It's primarily small, very small, medium-sized businesses, and they won't have that expertise, which is why we try and, let them know about things they should be worrying about and ways to protect themselves, whether it's insurance or otherwise. So that, that is an increasingly important one uh, that, that we do. It's why we partner with folks like Gore and others about saying, how do you manage your risk and protect yourself in a cost-effective way uh, as a small business? Um, this is fascinating. I'm enjoying this, but uh, I, I want to make sure I get through my questions that I'm sure I'll have a, a few more at the end. But um, I, I want to talk about, about um, about the the foundation, so you got the, the you know and 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 the the investments and I want to say investments the um, the support you give to the community and and your foundation has made investments in healthcare and education and uh, you know not for profits. I want to talk about because I think that you, you talk about purpose driven. Uh, you talk about the the things that you're going to do. Talk about what you have done and the investments that have been made because. I think sometimes uh, as, as A, Canadians, and B, insurance, yeah. we don't, you don't do a particularly good job of patting yourself on the back. But I think it's important for people to understand there is a Gore Foundation. It's investing in the community. And I think the expectation is you'll continue to be investing in this, in this region where it's going to be your home moving forward uh, as, or continue to be your home as you move forward. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ian. Uh, um, you know, I love this topic. And, and I think the... Um, you know, the past we have, we've, we've done amazing things with the foundation, uh, a real focus on supporting, um, you know, in a major, major way, the local um, healthcare, uh, you know, both all of the hospitals, for example, uh, doing meaningful contributions to the hospitals. But what I found also interesting, and I think you see this every day, you mentioned our members are our small business. There are, um, you know, quite literally, you know, hundreds if not thousands of small organizations that need support every year. Um, and, you know, it could even be as little as $1,000 to $5,000. Um, and we have been there in the community with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these um, organizations that we support every year through a, a range of, uh, of contributions, both the big major programs like the hospitals and the small, um, uh, you know, organizations that, that are kind of the fabric of our community. And we've been really proud of that. Specifically, um, this year, during the pandemic, um, we, we embraced the term of leading with purpose again. So we, we, we said to ourselves, you know, when we look back on this, um, this crisis, um, you know, in years to come, we, want, we will be measured as to how did we behave um, as, an as a corporate entity and how do we treat our employees, our policyholders, 
And so we last year had a historic donation, um, a $2 million Canada Helps Matching donation came out of the foundation, directed right at the front lines, frontline responders and healthcare to really try to be there to help. And that was a matching donation. So the total was over 4 million. And again, for a company of our size and a foundation of our size, that was one of the largest ones in Canada. Um, so we're really proud of that. Um, going forward, where I see um, this going, which is gonna be really exciting, is allowing our members to shape the impact that we have and our, and our policyholders. Um, so if you think as, as a purpose-driven organization, we, we will have a number of initiatives um, where we will have campaigns, social impact campaigns. You know, what problems are we trying to solve in the community? But also allowing our members to particularly vote or um, have an influence on where those funds are redistributed. And I think we haven't done enough of that in the past, um, linking the work that the foundation and the company is doing back to you as a customer, of course. So again, it goes back to that purpose driven. If you buy a policy from us, you're gonna get you know, insurance coverage, it's gonna be competitive pricing, but you know that you're, the funds are being invested in responsible ways in the investments. And also you can help shape what impact we would have in our communities that we live in, which is really exciting. In early days for us there, we have a lot more work to do on that, but we think that's gonna be quite powerful for our, uh, for our customers and employees and bring a lot of pride to, to our organization. Okay, um, I wanna ask, uh, I know, and I maybe, maybe speak to this, uh, um, while you're located in, uh, in Cambridge, You've supported hospitals, all, all three of the hospitals, uh, in, in, from time to time as they've had their capital campaigns, the United Way across the Waterloo region, local charities, business organizations. Um, I mean, I think maybe just to put a maybe a, a exclamation point, you know, Waterloo region as a whole, it's not Cambridge. You, you are supporting healthcare in the region, education in the region, um, not for profits in the region, and I, and I think that's you, you've, you've expressed that. But that's that's your your this home base is this is this entire region and what it has to offer. Absolutely, and even more broadly, um, like it's not a it's not just a Cambridge centric focus. It really is um, the communities that our employees live in, um, you know, which is quite broad. Um, but absolutely, the the entire region of of Waterloo, which is core to us. And, and and we're in Vancouver and we're in the GTA, we'll be supporting those communities as well. Um, but it's certainly, um, you know, the impact we can have is quite meaningful and wanting mm -hmm. to make sure that we're sharing that and spreading that um, in the communities that we that we do business is really important to us. Okay, a couple of questions that have come into the chat. You can feel free to punt on these because these are fresh to all of us. I I'm, I'm, I'm don't pretend to understand what this one is. Number of people leaving urban areas for rural, do you see their potential growth for farm mutuals? And I, I don't kind of, um, I don't understand that. So maybe you can explain what that means and what, sure. you, what you see there. Yeah, it's a great, it's actually a great question. Um, there are, we're, we are a mutual insurance company, but uh, we don't actually sell farm insurance. There are many companies that are mutuals that are again, um, very important to the communities that they're in. So Air Farmers Mutual, Heartland uh, is a is in Waterloo. That's a, a farmers a farm mutual, and um, I think that's a that's a great comment. I think that there is there is a growth um, in the farming and rural communities, and farm mutuals play a really important role in those communities. And uh, we do see some consolidation happening there. So Heartland is a good example. It, they have merged with other farm mutuals to uh, make themselves stronger. They're going through the same challenges that we have. They have to invest in technology. Uh, they're looking for talent and they're much smaller, the farm mutuals. Um, so I think there is a bright future for the farm mutuals. Uh, and they're the, the ones that are investing in just as we are the future. And you are seeing actually a lot of them doing that, which is very encouraging. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the question here, if I get my glasses on, what are your suggestions for companies who are looking to prepare plans as they transition back into a hybrid model? What elements should they be considering to plan for? So I think this is less on the insurance side than you as a business. 
going into that into that hybrid and and actually i'm interested in this because we're trying to figure out when we go back probably in january ish uh what does that look like and and having a plan together what's what's your advice to those thinking about that yeah yeah great question i, I can give you the experience that we had which was at first we um you know we got together as a management team we started to talk about it and and what happened was and you may find this in your organizations everybody's bias started to come into the, the the analysis so there's those that want to work from home forever um would start to advocate for that model some want everybody to come back to work and so they're saying well this is just a fad everybody's got to come back into the office and i could see very quickly that we were going to find ourselves in a position that wasn't um, healthy so what we did and again you don't need to go outside i, I think to do this we did actually partner with um with a consulting firm to help us go through a process um, so that it was objective and not biased by any individual executive or leader um, but i think you could do this just internally quite easily and i think there's a few key important points to it. the first one we did was we did engage our employees so we went out and we surveyed our employees we asked them uh, what their views on the future are how they'd like to work just so that we made sure we were listening because it didn't make sense to us to roll something out that was completely um, you know, blind to what the needs of our employees were. So I think that's an important piece. But overlaying that, um, this is where I was saying the, there needs to be a bit of a focus on business performance, high performance. So we, we actually looked at it by role and by department. So each and every role what do you, what's the best way that role should be shaped to drive the outcomes that you're hoping to achieve? And if you feel that role can be uh, effective working remotely, then that's great. Some roles clearly should be together and physically in the office, some not so much. So I think the understanding that the role level is important. And then the third piece is the culture. So what culture are you trying to create? Um, and again, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer because it's unique to your industry, your company, who you are. There are some companies who are saying the office is really important to our culture. So we want an office culture. We want people to come in on a regular basis. Nothing wrong with that for their organization. Others are saying, we think we can do this completely virtually. I know many of my peers and others outside of our industry too. And then that we're, we're somewhere in the middle where we feel there's flexibility, but we would like a framework. We would like to have touch points where we can be together. Um, so I think those three pieces, you know, engaging your employees, thinking about the outcomes. So it's a, it's a performance mindset. You're not letting the biases drive the model, but how do you actually design a high performance model? And then also thinking about um, your culture and what are you trying to create as an organization? Um, and I think those three served us quite well. That's uh, that's good advice, and because uh, we're going through the same thing. So uh, I've, I hope uh, my team's watching this today. We're taking notes, and we'll use those as our, as some of our guidelines. Okay, well, we've got a couple of minutes left, and then we got to wrap up. Um, I, I wanted to end with not that it's necessarily important um, to everybody, but your brand refresh I think says a lot about what you everything you've talked about. You always try and having your tagline or how you're going to market yourself. Maybe talk about what your what your new branding is going to be because I think what it really does is it talks about everything you've talked about over the last hour. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Ian. I think um, you know Gore Mutual Insurance, uh, you know, has been a, our name for 181 years, um, but we recognize that it's you know it's, we don't have a modern value proposition in the market so people don't really understand what a mutual is they don't understand insurance um, and they and so our our purpose direction which is to provide insurance that does good so the future brand refresh will still we'll still have the name gore mutual and it'll be a modern look and feel with the tagline of insurance that does good and then within that the three pillars that i talked about do good be good and spread good and i think I think it allows us the opportunity to have a conversation around what we're referring to as the modernization of the mutual model and, and uh, you know, what is different? Like, why would you buy insurance from a mutual versus a company that's a public company? And the fact that as a customer of Gore, we have the ability to do good in the world, to redistribute um, the premiums we take in, to pay claims, to employ people, to give back to the communities that we live in. 
And we think that's a powerful um, story. We're, again, we're early days on developing that, but our new brand will have a, will really reflect that concept of good and the differentiation of the, uh, the mutual model. And we're really excited about that. We're hoping to launch that later this year, um, mid to late this year. All right, we're gonna leave it there. Um, I wanna thank you, Andy, for joining us uh, today. I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule because it sounds like you got a lot on your plate. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for having me. It was my pleasure. And uh, thank you for um, all the support and all the great work that the Chamber is doing to help our, uh, our community. Thanks so much. Okay, and to our title sponsor for the series, Manulife, our platinum sponsor of the series, the Immigration Partnership of Waterloo Region, to this month's presenting sponsor, Andy and this and this team at Gore Mutual Insurance. And finally, for all of you for joining us today, as a reminder, we do host a new business success series session every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Join us next week as Andrew Beeler, Director of Partnerships and Learning with the Business and Higher Education Roundtable, joins us for business resources, tools for working with students. He'll be sharing the launch of a new work integrated learning hub a resource hub that will provide business with tools and resources to help them maximize their experience working with students. For all the details and to register, go to greaterkwchamber.com. Please do share this uh, series with your friends and colleagues. Join us every Wednesday afternoon for another edition of the Business Success Series. Because if it's Wednesday, it's the Business Success Series. And I'll leave you with this. Uh, please go, if you're any small business, go to chambercheck.ca get free rapid screening kits um, and free medical grade masks, all courtesy of uh, the Cambridge and Greater KW Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's gonna be a while yet before we're through this, we'll get vaccinated, but take care of yourself, your staff, uh, so we can safely open and stay open. And remember to stay positive, test negative, as we're stronger together. Have a great afternoon. Thanks everybody. <laughs>